in the PPS class, we have discussed about the effect of time on the oxide thickness. So, we have deduced two types of individual cases, one is the thickness as a function of temperature and we see that uh, with time, what we find that when time is very small, for small time of oxidation, we find that there is a thickness which is depending on the time itself, that means it is linear with time. The thickness which is growing is linear with time. Now, when time is increased, that means when we increase T for large T, what we have seen that x equals to uh, this expression and which boils down to x square equals to b into T plus tau, that means it is the parabolic rate constant. Why we shall say it is a parabolic rate constant? Because uh, of the nature of this relation of the thickness with time. As the oxide layer becomes thicker, the oxidant must diffuse through the oxide layer to react at the silicon silicon dioxide interface and the reaction becomes diffusion limited. This thing we have basically uh, used here that when the there will be an diffusion of oxygen and this oxide. So, uh, there will be the diffusion of the oxygen with the uh, oxides and when it passes through the diffusion passes through the silicon dioxide layer there will be the diffusion. Okay. So, this is the diffusion path through which the oxidizing species will move through uh, to the semiconductor surface because the reaction will take place at the semiconductor surface itself reaction between in this case silicon and oxygen or silicon with the oxygen in the water vapor or steam. So, when some layer is grown after initial formation of the oxide layer, there will be diffusion and that so the reaction here will be the diffusion limited. <coughs> and the oxide growth then becomes proportional to the square root of the oxidizing time which results in a parabolic growth rate. And as mentioned earlier that B is the parabolic rate constant. However, this parabolic rate constant or the linear rate constant B by A for small t, those are uh, basically agree with the prediction through this model. So, with this model we came across two types of rate constant for small t it is linear B by A for large t it is B which is parabolic in nature. For weight oxidation this d0 is very small. For weight oxidation this d0 is very small you can consider it is almost 0. However, for dry oxidation extrapolated value of d0 at t equals to 0 is almost 20 nanometers quite high. And you see that in this graph we have shown the linear rate constant that means B by A as a function of the temperature it is basically 1000 by T, the unit is uh, Kelvin inverse in this case it is micro meter per hour the linear rate constant B by A. You see that the variation it is basically the temperature variation of the linear rate constant the variation is a straight line. So, that means it follows the relation exponential minus E A by K T. And this is Arrhenius type of relation and this E A is the activation energy, this E A is the activation energy. Uh, it follows in all the cases that here the two cases have been shown in the blue lines it is silicon 100 plane, on the dashed lines it is silicon 111 plane. So, from this view graph also we shall uh, be able to understand why there will be a difference between the crystalline plane when silicon is 100 the value is low the linear rate constant value is low. However, when we take a piece of silicon having 111 plane, so at that plane 111 plane you see that the value of the linear rate constant is higher in both the cases 
and in the lower graphs it is basically the source material is the dry oxygen oxygen and it is 10 to the power 5 pascal pressure is applied whereas in the upper two uh, you see that water uh, vapor is used having 10 to the power 5 pascal the same um, pressure is used and the activation energy calculated is of it is at in both the cases 2 electron volt in for dry oxygen source in both the 100 silicon or 111 silicon you see that the activation energy is, is 2 electron volt whereas the activation energy for 100 or 111 silicon with the source as the water vapor or steam is 2.05 electron volt. So, we can and conclude that the activation energy is 2 electron volt for both dry and wet oxidation. Now, if we consider that the what is the uh, energy required to break a silicon silicon bond? If you want to break a silicon silicon bond, the energy energy required to break silicon silicon bonds it is almost 1.83 electron volt per molecules and what we are getting activation energy we are getting 2 electron volt. So, they are basically closely matching. So, this so they are basically closely matching that energy required to break the silicon silicon bonds and the activation energy for dry and wet oxidation. So, uh, linear rate constant is basically the breaking of the silicon silicon bonds for uh, reacting with the oxygen. Now, B by A the <coughs> linear rate constant it also depends on crystal orientation. It also depends on crystal orientation it is related to rate of incorporation of oxygen atoms into silicon which it which in turn depends on surface bond structure of silicon atoms. So, uh, in this case we see that the value of the uh, linear rate constant is higher uh, whether it is dry or wet oxidation the rate is higher for 111 silicon in both the cases. Why it is so? Because the density of available bonds on 111 silicon plane is higher than that on the 100 silicon plane and so the linear rate constant for 111 silicon is larger. And obviously, with this value uh, there is a close matching between the experimental and this is the experimental curve and the theoretically obtained value of the silicon silicon bond breaking energy and so it is consistent. So, this uh, proves the efficacy of the model which is which is able to describe the kinetics of oxidation in SI SiO2. Now, the same thing here it is the linear rate constant as a function of temperature here we have plotted the parabolic rate constant as a function of temperature. <coughs> here also we see that the variation is like the uh, Arrhenius type exponential minus Ea by Kt because you see that in this case only it can be uh, shown using a straight line plot like say something say y equals to e to the power minus Ea by Kt. So, you take log y it is equals to minus Ea by Kt. So, that means the activation energy E by K multiplied by 1 by T. So, if you plot 1 by T versus ln y. So, it is a log scale if you it is basically the, the parabolic rate constant that means y is nothing but b. So, ln b it is the b value parabolic rate constant it is the log is taken and it is basically the with 1 by t it will be a straight line. So, it is a straight line and the slope of this line minus e a by k, k is a constant and here you see that uh, this E a value in this case that means the activation energy for dry oxidation is 1.24 electron volt whereas, whereas for weight oxidation the value is 0 0.71 electron volt. So, 
if you compare with this thing here in both the cases 2 electron volt here it is different. So, we shall uh, explain the difference also when 1.24 electron volt is the activation energy for the dry oxidation that is the parabolic rate constant is concerned and theoretically available value of oxygen diffusion in fused silica it is 1.18 electron volt. So, if you compare these two value that means for parabolic rate constant B the value of activation energy in dry oxygen it is 1.24 electron volt and you can compare this value with the value of the oxygen diffusion in fused silica that is 1.18 electron volt. <coughs> so, we find that this is basically the diffusion of oxygen through fused silica as discussed earlier in relation with the parabolic rate constant. Similarly, for B parabolic rate constant here the activation energy in wet oxidation that means, if you use water vapor or steam it is basically you see that it is 0 0.71 electron volt. So, it is 0 0.71 electron volt and you can compare this value with the diffusion of water vapor in fused silica. What is its value? Its value is 0 0.79 electron volt. So, this value is consistent with this value. Similarly, this value is consistent with this value. So, it can account for the diffusion of either oxygen or water molecule through the SiO2 layer to the SI surface. Now, you see that in this case B does not depend on crystal orientation since it is related to the diffusion process through a random network layer of amorphous silica. Okay, so, uh, in this case it depends on the crystal orientation, but B does not depend on crystal orientation. Why? Because it is a diffusion process. It is a diffusion process and diffusion is always random through a uh, amorphous silica and it also a random network layer through a ran random network layer of amorphous silica. So, obviously, you can see that uh, there should not be any dependence on the crystal orientation so far as the parabolic rate constant is concerned. Now, <coughs> oxides grown in dry oxygen have the best electrical properties. It has been experimentally observed that oxides grown in dry oxygen have the best electrical properties more time is required to grow the same oxide thickness at a given temperature in dry oxygen than in water vapor and thin oxide say gate oxide in MOSFET is generally less than 20 nanometer is grown by dry oxidation because oxides grown in dry oxygen have the best electrical properties and in a MOSFET so far as the gate oxide is concerned we want that there must be very very uh, efficient electrical properties free from any kind of uh, uh, porosity etcetera. B why? Because otherwise there will be leakage current alloy uh, enhancement as well as the dielectric breakdown. So, the property that we need for the gate oxide, this gate oxide in a MOS device. So, this gate oxide have the highest quality of oxide layer. So, far as the as the electrical properties are concerned. Why? Because in a MOS device, you can realize that one important thing is the leakage current. 
you have to reduce you have to reduce it you have to reduce it and another thing is there should not be dielectric breakdown. So, high dielectric breakdown high dielectric breakdown. So, the dielectric breakdown will be high and this too can be achieved if we have some highest quality of oxide layer and that is the reason that oxides grown in dry oxygen is always used because this gate oxide thickness if you consider the thickness T it is less than equals to 20 nanometer very thin. However, for thicker oxides where the thicker oxides are used say field oxides in MOS ICs it is greater than 20 nanometer for bipolar devices and you can use the oxidation in water vapor or steam because if we if we go back to the first slide from where we have started that in this case you see that this field oxide can be a thick oxide. Field oxide can be a thick oxide because it is used for isolation with the adjacent device. So, this is a device consider that is device 1 and on both the sides there is device say this is device n. So, it can be device n plus 1 it is device n minus 1. So, there must be isolation between n minus 1 and n as well as n and n plus 1. So, on both the sides there must be field oxide which will give us the uh, which will give us the uh, value of the uh, isolation reasonable. And you see that uh, in this case thicker oxides oxidation in water vapor or steam we can use because uh, thicker oxides is there. So, first you can use a uh, oxide grown in dry oxygen and then over dry oxygen you can grow water vapor oxidation with water vapor for thick. Now, in this figure you see that this is the experimental results of silicon dioxide thickness as a function of reaction time. So, on the x axis we have oxidation time and on the x axis we have oxide thickness in micron in both the graphs. The left one represents this is in dry oxidation and the right one is the wet oxidation and in both the cases both 100 and 111 plane of silicons were used. So, in this case in the dry oxidation you see that the solid line and the dashed line it is basically there is a variation. So, it is 800 degree centigrade, it is 700 degree centigrade, it is 1200 degree centigrade. So, as the temperature of oxidation increases, as the temperature of oxidation is increase uh, oxidation increases we see that the growth is more. So, at a particular time say if we consider that at 10 hour after 10 hour this is 10 hour if you grow at 800 degree centigrade it is basically 0.0. 3 0.01, 0.02, 0.03. However, at 10 hour for say 1200 degree centigrade it is very high almost 0.8 or 0.7 micron. So, it is 0 0.02 micron whereas, for the same time but the temperature is different as the temperature increases the oxide thickness also increases. And also you, you can find that oxide thickness grown on 111, 111 means the dashed line is uh, 11 substrate is larger than that grown on 100 substrate because of the larger linear rate constant of 111 orientation. We have seen that the rate constant linear rate constant in 111 is higher in case of yes you see that here 111 and 100 plane we have considered this is the linear rate constant and the linear rate constant is distinctively higher. It is distinctively higher and so, since the linear rate constant is higher for 111 plane. So, obviously, here in 111 orientation the uh, thickness of oxide grown on 111 is larger. However, in this case for weight oxidation you see that oxide flames grown by weight oxidation has thickness 5 to 10 times thicker than that by dry oxidation. You consider any value say for 900 degree centigrade 
So, 900 degree centigrade 1 hour, 900 degree centigrade 1 hour is basically 0.1 then 0.2 it is 0.3. So, somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3 and 900 degree centigrade 1 hour. Here you see that uh, this is 900 degree centigrade at 1 hour it is almost 0 0.02 or if you consider the 1 1 plane it is 0 0.03. So, several orders of magnitude at, at least 5 to 10 times thicker than that by uh, dry oxidation is obtained if you grow by wet oxidation. So, these are two important uh, uh, conclusion of the oxidation one by dry and another by wet that wet oxidation thickness of the oxide flames grown by wet oxidation is always thicker than that uh, than that. Uh, grown by dry oxidation. And also since the diffusion through a random network of, of say uh, amorphous sites in, in SiO2 layer is basically random in nature. So, we can say that the there is no uh, um, uh, bearing of the uh, crystal orientation so far as the B is concerned or the parabolic rate constant is concerned. Now, Thin oxide growth precise control over thickness because the thickness is very important as we have seen that for our gallium arsenide MOS devices it is basically if you use the gate oxide it is basically less than equals to 20 nanometer. So, uh, you must have very control. So, so the growth rate must have some um, nanometer per second or say uh, few nanometer per minute. So, that precise control is possible. So, always slow growth rate is there, always you can have very slow growth rate and the general ambient or the uh, general uh, conditions, optimum conditions that are used for the thin oxide growth is the growth in dry oxygen at atmospheric pressure and lower temperature. Because we have seen that the lower temperature the uh, growth rate is small. However, for higher temperature the growth rate is very very large. So, you cannot uh, control at higher temperature. If you need say 2 nanometer, 5 nanometer, 3 nanometer of oxide thickness with this temperature you cannot be able to control always. So, uh, rather you use 800 to 900 degree centigrade and at, uh, use dry oxygen because in wet oxygen what happens wet oxidation thickness is 5 to 10 times thicker. So, do not go for that and growth at pressure lower than atmospheric pressure because if you grow in a low atmospheric pressure condition or reduced atmospheric pressure condition there is uh, the growth rate will be further lowered. So, you use the moderate temperature as well as the lower atmospheric pressure then the growth rate will be sufficiently low and you can control the growth rate. Another point is the growth in a reduced partial pressure of oxygen by using a diluent inert gas. So, uh, you can use helium or argon or nitrogen together with gas containing the oxidizing species. So, that means you reduce the partial pressure because the growth rate is directly proportional to the partial pressure. So, if you can reduce the partial pressure by diluting it then obviously, the growth rate will be quite low and use of composite oxide films with the gate oxide films consisting of a layer of thermally grown SiO2 and a over layer of CVD SiO2. So, that means you can have gate oxide films consisting of a layer of thermally grown SiO2. So, first you use a thermally grown SiO2 layer this is your silicon substrate. So, this SiO2 is thermally grown, then above SiO2 thermally grown you can use CVD that is also SiO2, but it is not by thermally grown it is by CVD. So, these are the techniques that one can use for making the uh, silicon oxide film which can have very controlled growth because in all the cases we have seen that we need very very small and this age of mini in this age of miniaturization we have 
say 2 nanometer or 3 nanometer or 5 nanometer growth. So, precise control one is the temperature you reduce, number two is the uh, you dilute the oxygen by say argon or helium or nitrogen or you say uh, that you take the uh, growth pressure lower than the atmospheric pressure that means you grow at reduced pressure or you grow very if you need a thick oxide layer then you use the thermally grown SiO2 and then over that CVD grown SiO2. So, these are the uh, approach that one can have say gate oxide very thin and very control growth and the mainstream approach for gate oxide is that what is the mainstream approach for gate oxide? The mainstream approach for gate oxide is vertical oxidation furnace can grow reproducible high quality 10 nanometer oxides to within 0.1 nanometer across the wafer growth at atmospheric pressure and lower temperatures. So, this is the mainstream approach for gate oxide 10 nanometer it is possible reproducible that is very important because batch processing is done and all the you see that all the computer chips are made of SI where SiO2 is, is extensively used and in one wafer you can have this kind of a wafer the wafer diameter can be 2 inch to say 8 inch. So, in a 8, eight, eight inch diameter you must have uniform growth of SiO2 uniform growth throughout the length and breadth throughout the uh, surface and all the areas it must be a uniform growth and this uniform growth is essential uniform SiO2 growth it is essential and you see that in this uniform SiO2 growth what you can do that 10 nanometer is possible plus minus 0 0.1 nanometer that is very important plus minus 1 nanometer across the wafer that means <coughs> here say it is 10 nanometer here it is 10 nanometer or at this side it can be 10 plus minus 0 0.1 nanometer. So, very very uh, controllable growth is possible so that is the mainstream approach. Later on we shall see that this SiO2 can be grown by other methods also as well like uh, CVD and different kinds of precursors we can use that we can and consider in the later stages. Then what happened that here we have considered that we have some oxidation and this oxidation and have different type of approaches because uh, in a MOSFET there are different kinds of layers also. So, let us discuss something about this dielectric layer which is essential for device fabrication as well because in a in a dielectric layer what happens that uh, silicon nitride is obviously generally uh, used and this silicon nitrides can be have different types of uh, growth and also we can have thick oxide layer like SiO2 say you can use that hot wall reduced pressure reactor because this is the CVD approach and parallel plate plasma deposited reactor also we have so that the lower portion you see that uh, there are aluminum electrodes and in between the aluminum electrodes the wafers are placed where there is a gas inlet pumping system etcetera. This blue are the wafers where you can uh, put several wafers at the same time and RF source is there because in RF source what happens there is a, a chance to uh, form the plasma because the, the because in this case that will be very very uh, uniform growth of SiO2 and there can be say glass cylinders etcetera uh, inside that there are the wafers are kept and the plasma is formed by the insulated RF input and pumping is required because you have to reduce the uh, pressure inside the air atmosphere you have to uh, um, take out and if you need say plasma of say argon or anything and then you have to or hydrogen then we have to use that kind of a gas inlet for making this plasma. Now, one experimental apparatus for the uh, O3 TOS chemical vapor deposition system in this uh, 
TO's chemical vapor deposition, we see that there are ozonizer, then there can be phosphorus or boron source because you can dope SiO2, you can dope SiO2 and uh, TOS is one of the precursors. Here you see that the nitrogen uh, vapor is used for making the uh, uh, transporting the gases. So, uh, phosphorus source it can be say phosphine, boron source it is it can be uh, boron hydride and then ozonizers is also there where the input is oxygen. So, what are the things that we, we send? One is that you see that oxygen, number two is TOS and if you need P type or N type doping, then you have to use either boron or phosphorus respectively because boron gives you the P type doping and phosphorus the N type doping and there will be sufficient accumulation of the vapor pressure and that vapor pressure will be transported by the nitrogen as a carrier gas to the reactor site. Here there will be some uh, silicon substrate, vacuum chuck is used, heater is also used to heat and dispersion head for the uniform dispersion of all the chemicals and there will be growth of the uh, TOS uh, used CVD SiO2. Then if you have some uh, ozone concentration with sinkage, you see that there is a ozone concentration with the uh, sinkage and dependence of the sinkage of O3 TO CVD film on ozone concentration using annealing. So, two uh, annealing temperatures are used, one annealed at 950 degree centigrade, another is 450 degree centigrade and the deposition was took place at 400 degree centigrade, the heater is there. So, the deposition took place as 400 degree centigrade and at that temperature you see that uh, there is a sinkage when the annealing temperature is uh, almost double. So, uh, the sinkage is more when the annealing temperature is more because from 450 degree centigrade to 950 degree centigrade you see that the sinkage is quite high from almost uh, 3.8 to 8.6 or 8.8 at uh, a particular ozone concentration. However, when the ozone concentration is reduced, when the ozone concentration is reduced, the sinkage is also reduced. So, that is one important aspect of the uh, uh, film and the, if you consider the step coverage that you see that it is the conformal step coverage. In conformal step coverage what happens that in a conformal type of coverage the all the regions, all the regions, all the sides will be conformally deposited. The material will deposit uh, uniformly on all the sides etcetera in the corners region everywhere there will be uniform deposition. So, that is known as the conformal. Here you see that in all the directions the thickness is same, thickness of the deposited film is same, but in this case you see that it is not conformal, it is non-conformal in the sense that in some of the regions the thickness is poor and in some of the regions the thickness is uniform. When they are making an angle phi 1, so it is uniform, but when they are making an angle phi 2. So, there is some um, reduction in the thickness or in phi 3s that means the uh, precursor molecules are coming at a at an angle say with phi 3 then it is still uh, reduced. So, depending on the angle of the uh, uh, deposition, so the thickness of the flames will be different. Now, it is basically the a calculated gate and interconnect delay versus uh, uh, technology generation and different kinds of uh, technology have been used and the dielectric constant for low K material is 2 a low K material and both aluminum and copper are 0 0.8 micron thick and 43 micron long both aluminum and copper and uh, they are 0 0.8 micron thick and 43 micron long. So, uh, there are uh, some you see that uh, some at delays, gate delays is this, this one is a gate delay. So, gate delay is reducing 
as the minimum feature length is reduced. So, from 650 nanometer to 100 nanometer you see that there is a reduction of the feature size and at the same time the delay in picosecond is also reduced from say 17.5 to 2.5 at 100 nanometer. However, interconnect delay copper and a low k you see that this is the interconnect delay. Interconnect delay is basically very high if you consider the minimum feature length. It is gate with uh, aluminum and SiO2, Si SiO2 aluminum is the metal gate. And then uh, interconnect delay you see that interconnect delay is aluminum and SiO2, this interconnect delay is also increasing. So, both the interconnect delay and uh, that uh, interconnect delay with copper, this is the copper and interconnect delay with uh, aluminum, this is uh, this uh, triangles are the copper and this rectangular are the aluminum. So, both are increasing aluminum um, increasing um, where the increase in aluminum is is very high is steep st rather compared to the copper. However, if you uh, sum at the delays, so if you take the sum, so these two are the summation of delays the blue one, however, the gate delay is low. So, uh, you see that the interconnect delay and gate delay versus the uh, technology generation. So, one has to make uh, some um, optimization, so that the delay will be small, because with the gate delay it is reducing, but the interconnect delay is increasing and the sum is obviously the increasing. Here you see that it is basically the when there is a polysilicon electrode maximum time to breakdown versus maximum time to breakdown versus uh, uh, thickness for a polysilicon electrode. That uh, polysilicon electrode is as mentioned earlier that it is basically the polycrystalline silicon and with aluminum electrode you see that as the D increases, D increases obviously the thickness basically it is the thickness oxide thickness is D and maximum time to break down it is second. So, uh, maximum time to break down also increases, but it must be thick enough. Even if you take a say 20 nanometer or say 50 nanometer gate, uh, 15 nanometer or 20 nanometer aluminum electrode, you see that maximum time to break down is almost is very small 10 second compared to 100 nanometer where it is 10 to the power 4 second. Here the oxide thickness uh, dielectric constant dielectric is the breakdown voltage is 5 mega volt per centimeter obviously very high and temperature is 300 degree centigrade, the very high temperature also. Now, if you uh, consider the polysilicon electrode you see that this is the polysilicon electrode, here whatever be the thickness of the oxide layer, whatever be the thickness of SiO2, if you use this as a polysilicon, this blue one is polysilicon. So, then the uh, breakdown is very high it is above 10 to the power 5 uh, second, and, but it is uniform throughout the thickness. So, it has no bearing on the value of the thickness of the uh, oxide layer. So, that means, we can uh, have two types of situation, two situations. One is this uh, SI substrate on which we have SiO2 and over which we have this is D thickness over which we have aluminum, this is aluminum. So, this is one situation. Another situation is number 2 situation is you have silicon over which we have SiO2 of the same thickness the D SiO2. 
the thickness is d this thickness is d this thickness is d and above which we have polysilicon so these two situations are there and if we if we put a voltage the breakdown voltage will be here given and at uh, 5 mega volt per centimeter has been suppose you use at 300 degree centigrade. So, under this situation we are considering two cases if you use this polysilicon gate you see if you use this uh, polysilicon gate. So, if you use this polysilicon gate it is almost constant this is almost constant and if you use this aluminum gate and with this aluminum gate you see that it is a function of the thickness. So, it is not a function of the thickness however, this is a function of the thickness. So, the polysilicon gate is always better than this as silicon uh, aluminum gate. So, people have been using this polysilicon gate for quite a long time and you can dope the polysilicon as well but n type or p type depending on your different kind of applications. Now, uh, how the deposition rate of polysilicon depends on the silent partial pressure, the effect of silent concentration on the polysilicon deposition rate. You see that uh, for different temperatures are used 628 degree centigrade, 656 degree centigrade, 674 degree centigrade, 698 degree centigrade. So, four uh, temperatures are used and with that temperature you see that the deposition rate is linear for lower silicon silent pressure. So, uh, up to say 2 Pascal, 3 Pascal partial pressure it is almost linear. Then above which it is going to be saturated. Okay. So, uh, if you use very high temperature say almost 700 degree centigrade. So, it is linear up to say 3 Pascal then above there is an increase but is going to be slowly it is reduced and the position rate is limited by the higher silicon partial pressure. So, if you put silen with very high partial pressure, so the deposition rate will be smaller. And uh, if you consider the seat resistance versus uh, the ion dose uh, into 500 nanometer polysilicon at 30 kilo, uh, kilo electron volt 30 kev you see that for single crystal the seat resistance is very low, but this seat resistance increases when you dope phosphorus in polysilicon or if you dope antimony in polysilicon it is it is basically up to say 10 to the power 5 into 10 to the power 13 ion, ion dose it is almost the seat resistance is almost constant independent of the ion, ion dose then it reduces the seed resistance reduces. Similarly, for phosphorus doped polysilicon it is basically uh, reducing and further reduction after 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 16 ion dose per centimeter square. <coughs> then if you have some say uh, sputtering target you have you can have substrate and target. So, depending on the uh, target position you can have different kinds of growth of the deposited flame. This is the standard sputtering, this is standard sputtering wh wh what we use in our uh, daily uh, laboratories. This is basically the target uh, when the long through sputtering is used and it is sputtering with a collimator. So, uh, in collimator is basically you see that the angles are reduced because of the collimator. <coughs> now, with this uh, one important thing is that this uh, if you see the cross sectional view of a MOSFET with a barrier metal between aluminum and silicon and a composite gate electrode of silicide and polysilicon the details of which we shall discuss that uh, in this case the aluminum spiking will not be there because of this barrier metal and also uh, we have used some uh, silicides 
for uh, making the dielectric breakdown very high. Now, let us consider the earlier diagram where we have used this uh, oxidation that in this process technology that uh, where this we have used extensively in, in making the p n junction the it is very important and in this case you see that what are the steps that we use here this is a bare n type silicon wafer we start with and then we oxidize silicon wafer by dry or wet oxidation the details of which are are already discussed and finally we apply a resist mask for for some pattern transfer and resist exposure through the mask to obtain the different kind of pattern on the so uh, to obtain the different kind of pattern on the uh, silicon dioxide resist and finally the H nu that means the ultraviolet irradiation is done with this ultraviolet irradiation and generally there can be say positive photoresist or negative photoresist depending on the positive or negative different kind of, of uh, developer solution is used to etch out and finally the device is obtained. So, here you see that when is when there when we use a gate oxide or a field oxide for the isolation or gate oxide under which the a channel is made from the source to the drain. Apart from this we can have say polysilicon which is deposited on SiO2 and uh, on polysilicon we, we can use aluminum for metallization. Here also you see that this is, this is the source contract, this is the source contact. So, directly we do not deposit aluminum on source uh, on, on the source or we directly we do not deposit aluminum on the drain rather since it is a uh, SI SiO2 MOS. So, always we prefer that always we prefer that on silicon direct deposition of aluminum is also possible, but better if we use a silicon and then some polysilicon and finally say aluminum. So, as discussed earlier that this is these two types of possibilities are there one is the direct deposition of aluminum on silicon or one is the deposition of aluminum on silicon through polysilicon and it can be doped suppose if it is n type silicon. So, you can dope polysilicon n plus type. So, that it, it is almost a monolithic type of uh, resist, uh, resistance path is there very small resistance the contact resistance will be very very small and it is basically a, a metal path type of uh, uh, concept can be created here because of the heavy doping of the polysilicon on n type of silicon before making the aluminum contact. So, here you see that we have used that polysilicon as a, a layer between the metal and the source and drain. So, this is the source contract is the drain contract. So, uh, if you consider that a silicon MOS, so this is SI. So, you have to make the source and the drain and the source and the drain are connected by say polysilicon. So, this is polysilicon this is polysilicon and here you use here you use the gate oxide SiO2. So, that a channel will be formed between source and drain below this SiO2 gate. So, this is the general structure of a silicon uh, MOS device where source and drain are used at the same time and SiO2 is the gate. <coughs> Obviously, here also we can use uh, a polysilicon gate above SiO2. So, be, 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 before making the 
SiO2, here we can use another polysilicon gate. This green patches are the polysilicon gate, polysilicon. But consider that at the top layer, we have used the dielectric SiN and SiN, the silicon nitride dielectrics as discussed earlier that this is for the <coughs> passivation of the surface. That is the protective coating, that is the protective coating and you see that in this protective coating, we have silicon nitride because it protects from the moisture, is protect from the dust and also is protect from the scratches. Such kind of dielectric layers have huge implications in case of or applications rather in case of the solar cell devices, not only in MOSFET. And in solar cell, you see that in solar cell what happens, the panels are formed and the panels are kept at uh, the rooftops or at the top of the trees, etcetera in the forest areas or in different kinds of the uh, buildings at different places. So, there is a chance that you can have moisture or dust particle or scratch over that. So, that will reduce the device life. So, dielectric deposition are made at the top of the surface. So, in essence uh, four type of layers we generally use. One is the oxide layer which is basically the gate oxide or the field oxide. Let us summarize in this sense in this way that we can have oxide layer which can be gate oxide or field oxide. <coughs> Remember that gate oxide is basically that thing below which source to drain channel layer is formed, channel layer is formed. So, this is very crucial in device operation. <coughs> Another thing is the field oxide, it is basically the isolation between the devices from one device to one another device. Say you, you can have n number of device, here it is n, this is n plus 1, this is n minus 1. So, you can make this isolation here and this isolation here. So, between these two layers of the devices, you use the field oxide or here you use the field oxide. So, oxide deposition is very important and today we have just discussed about the thermal oxidation in at, at, at length and the different kinds of model, the growth kinetics that we have obtained that we have considered. Then up, up, after oxide layer, we have seen that different kinds of dielectric layers are important, dielectric layers are there. And th those dielectric layers are basically the layers which protect from moisture, from dust and scratches. Also, these dielectric layers have is used for isolation as well as the dielectric layers are used for making the uh, gate dielectrics like say MOS devices, metal oxide semiconductor. Here also this is basically nothing but a dielectric. So, in later stages we, have, we shall find that different kinds of dielectrics are used say titanium oxide, zirconium oxide, tantalum oxide, hafnium oxide different types of oxides are used, those are basically dielectrics of very high value. And they are specific application in uh, uh, high K areas and in the next class we shall see that both type of dielectrics be it high K or low K is required for device applications. So, dielectric layers can be grown. Number 3 is the polysilicon. This is nothing but the polycrystalline silicon layer. It can be doped and we have seen that the 
breakdown on polysilicon basically does not depend on the thickness of the polysilicon. The breakdown uh, uh, is very high at very high voltage or it the breakdown time in terms of second is 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 second. And we have seen that this polysilicon or the polycrystalline silicon particularly you can dope for making polysilicon gate for making polysilicon source and drain between you put polysilicon between the metal and the silicon. So, the contact will be better with very low contact resistance. And the last one is the metal films. Generally two types of uh, metal concept we used one is the aluminum or it can be say silicides. These are very much important in case of silicon process technology. But we shall see that in case of other type of compounds like say 3 5 semiconductors, if you consider the 3 5 semiconductors not silicon then aluminum never used silicides are also not used in this case if it is n type then we use gold germanium or alloy or if it is p type we use gold zinc alloy. So, these are basically the alloys gold zinc, gold germanium, uh, pal silver palladium. So, different kinds of alloys are used for making the uh, metal films. The metal can be used for interconnections, it can be used for making the ohmic contact, it can be used for metal semiconductor short key barrier or rectifying barrier. And uh, we shall see that they, they have some advantages, disadvantages like aluminum spiking, electromigration, those things we, can, we shall discuss in the next lectures. Thank you.